start a recording start So what we covered yesterday, we, did, we have seen uh, what is infrastructure as a service, what is platform as a service, and what all the software as a service components, right? <laughs> the basic understanding of these components within AWS or Azure. So today we'll see how to access this AWS portal, okay? and how you can enroll yourself to practice on a day-to-day -day basis and what all the basic components that we need to understand before we start building the things in the AWS. These things we'll see today. <coughs> so anybody has the accounts in AWS? Yeah, I do have. You have, you have free tag or it's completely? I need to check. Like, uh, I have my uh, employees one, so I think it's pretty good. Okay. Okay. Fine. So, first thing is you need to create account in AWS. <coughs> How to do that? We'll see. So, if you go to AWS free tag. Just search AWS free tag. Okay. So AWS free tag, you'll get <coughs> these things. If you look at the things normally, you'll get a free free subscription, it will not say free subscription, this free tag is applicable and for anyone who, who enrolled for AWS account, okay? So in this, it's not free for everything. Normally you'll get 750 hours per month. Okay, if you look at 750 hours per month, compute, storage, database, <clears throat> and machine learning, and compute and a lot of these things because if you go back and see the things if you look at all the services each and every service and each and every service have their their own uh, building mechanism so we really can't combine everything and consider it as a single uh, entity so that is the reason why they have building for each and every component separately Right. So if you look at the computing, what is computing? Computing is just basically your virtual machine. Okay. So EC2. Instance. If you go to instance, launch instance. If you scroll down, you'll see a lot of these images are available. <clears throat> okay, you can deploy any image, but when it comes to size, you'll see a lot of these sizes are applicable based on the business requirement or business need. But for your account or anyone anyone who enrolls for the free tire for 12 months, this instance is free for 12 months. <clears throat> If you deploy one server with this size, T2 micro, and you leave it for 12 months, it is free. That is what it means. T2 micro or T3 micro. Okay, if you look at here, T2 micro. There's no T3 micro here. What happens normally, or normally what we will do is we'll try to test test these servers, or 
or we'll try to test the couple of scenarios in a day to day. So sometimes I may require four machines to be deployed in order to test some of the network load balancing or I, I may I might require to deploy two or three servers to test the web application. So that means if I deploy two servers, okay, and leave it for 15 days, then your free tire is over. Okay, if I deploy two servers and leave it for 15 days, your free tire free tire is over for that particular month, and the rest of the 15 days you you will be charged as per standard rates. You getting what I'm saying? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, and similarly storage you can upload up to 5 gb and 20000 request and 2000 request you can read right <clears throat> free for every month or it's for a year i guess yeah it's for a year okay and rds again 750 hours 750 hours means 24 into 31 and some overhead Twenty four hours into thirty one days, seven forty one. Okay, that's overhead around rounded seven fifty hours a month. Okay, and you have a lot of these components. Each has their own. Applicable free tier. Cloud front fifty GB, you can send the data. Okay, but be careful whenever you practice it. Okay, before you log off from the portal, delete everything. <clears throat> okay, before you log off from the portal, delete everything. Please never ever keep anything inside the portal, otherwise, you'll get charged for those. You never no, know. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, for compute, we can make it shut down, right? Not required because we are not doing any business here. We are just learning, right? If you are learning, once your practice is done, when once your practice is done, simply delete it. If you want, you can recreate it in two minutes. You won't take much time to deploy the servers. Okay. Uh, well, let's say I have a compute where I am planning to <clears throat> host some application. Uh, okay. Let's say any ERP application. Uh, because I basically I'm from a ERP background. So what usually I do is like once I <coughs> create an instance, I deploy a couple of applications where it will take like a minimum five to six hours of time to you know, get it generated and all. So okay. usually I make the compute instances shut down uh, and keep it. And uh, whenever uh, uh, the next time that I want to log, uh, log in, uh, we, we just uh, boot them. Okay, just power on and use it. Yeah, in that yeah. case, yeah, that that is only the way. In, when if your application is taking too much time to install and configure and test no. it, yeah, be on mute. Okay, your application is taking too much time to install, configure, and uh, run it. So it's good to shut down and keep it, <clears throat> and you will be charged for storage. Let's say you have three servers you deployed, and each has around hundred hundred gig of machine. Even though if you shut down it, that 100 gig is chargeable for 24 by 7. You understand what I'm saying? What I mean is, you have a machine. Yeah. Okay. And you install something and power it on. When you power on, the, the charges are some XYZ amount. Okay. Once your once your testing is done, you just power off. Then your charges will become minimal for storage. Okay. When you power on the charges for 
storage, CPU and RAM. So RAM and CPU charges were gone. Still storage you have to pay. Good. Okay. So that is the reason why whenever you see some bill keep on accumulating. Okay. So, uh, Sri, uh, just a quick question here. Yeah. Uh, let's assume, uh, like, there is a new uh, customer. I'm not sure, like, if this person is very much early for everybody on the floor. I okay. just want to get some uh, some confirmation on uh, what I'm saying. Okay. Let's say yeah. I have a new requirement. A customer says that uh, uh, I, I work uh, I work on a POCs or a RFCs, and uh, there is a RFC where a customer is expecting moving their entire infrastructure uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, and now he has to go for a uh, three options like he asked us to give like three best quotations one is for azure one is for uh, aws and one is for oci i mean for cloud and another one is google cloud uh -huh. so, uh, now what i have to do is like i have to calculate the cost of that okay you have this number of services and you have this number of storages and this uh -huh. number of so is there any uh, accumulate, uh, calculator that mm -hmm. defines uh, the cost or given rough estimation of, okay, this is the cost that you need to pay for one year or uh, you know, six months of subscription or you know uh, as a part of this duration uh, so that we can share it to the customer and say that, okay, if you are hosting this on your on-premises, this is the cost that you need to do. But if you are coming to OCA, this is the cost for AWS, this is the cost like that. I mean, to say, is there any, uh, I believe there is a calculator of uh, uh, billing, a billing calculator for AWS online. <laughs> I got you. But that is to satisfy the customer. That's not the practical thing, right? Right. Okay. Estimations are never met the customer requirements because this is all these costings are on the fly. If you use it, you'll be charged. If you're not using it, you don't need to pay, right? So whatever the rough estimations what we are providing, it is just to give an overview to the customer saying this is the approximate amount that you're going to pay. And that might be, I've seen a couple of scenarios where the estimation and the actual billing is 200% difference. Okay, now at least for a tentative idea. Let's say yeah. if I want to comparing the cost wise between AWS and uh, oh, Azure. No, no, no. That that is highly impossible because their CA and uh, AWS CA and uh, the AWS Azure CA that the billing mechanism what they have developed is completely bla black hole. You really can't get the values and cost mm -hmm. benefits of both because <clears throat> okay, if you are talking about just a server, okay, I will give you rough estimation the, this is the t2 micro and that is b2m b2s or this is this is the one large server okay let's go to here right for this let's let's say for example around 12000 rupees per month same server if i go back to azure maybe i'm getting it for 19000 but here in AWS, it's hourly billing. It's okay. hour, hourly billing. Hourly billing means if you turn on the machine, you will be charged for next one hour. If you turn, if you turn, hang on, hang on. If you turn off for some reason and turn on again, you will be charged for one more hour extra. Okay. Okay. Means whenever you reboot, it will be treated as a new session and it will be charged for one more hour okay but but when it comes to azure it's per second billing okay okay the pro rate basis billing the per second uh, okay the business requirement is nine to five uh, people are using and people turn on at morning nine and turn off at evening five it will be charged for the duration only Okay, uh, even though the estimation which is showing up on the screen and the end of the month, the bill you are getting, there is a lot of difference in the same. Because okay. the, the, the way it works is totally different. 
Okay, so in this case, like, what would be the recommendations for a customer? Like, I mean, if somebody wants to decide which would be the best comparatively for AWS and Azure, what are the matrices that we need to no, no, share? It didn't, no, I mean, to the to the reality, there is no realistic metrics. You can show up to the customer saying, you just have to go with AWS, or there's no realistic metric, you just have to go with the Azure. The people are more interested in Azure nowadays because of they are premium customers to Azure, mm -hmm. Microsoft, I, I'll say, and they do hold the lot of licensing and stuff in their on-premise. And if you have the license and stuff for, for your Windows infrastructure, you can straight away save the license cost up to 49% if you migrate, migrate your workloads to Azure. So that is, that is that is where they're getting more cost savings because they already hold the license. Okay. And if you are a gold or platinum customer with the Microsoft, you'll get a free, free support for at least two, three years. And any, any, can you be on mute? I'm getting a lot of background noise. Yeah, thank you. So if you, if you have the non-expiry license, because you can use those licenses anywhere, you don't need to purchase for each and every system. Okay, you'll, you'll get an accumulated license from Microsoft if you are a platinum partner. Same license, you can use it on Azure. And straight away, you'll get a 49% saving. When you compare with AWS, this is fairly good amount when you, when you look at the costing. So that is only the reason for a couple of customers, those who are really looking at for Azure, I'll say. And for other reasons, I don't think so. A lot of te technical standpoint, each and every component will work in their own way. A AWS has their own benefits and drawbacks. Azure has their own benefits and drawbacks. When it comes to the solution designing, it will clearly understand which component is feasible in AWS and which component is more feasible than AWS in Azure. But those things will not come into picture when you are delivering solution to a customer or when you are talking with the customer at the initial stage because you never know what components the customer going to use it when you when you are talking to the customer during the discovery sessions understand it's all, it's more of existing infra discovery and finding out the feasible solution for migration okay. <clears throat> yeah you, you really can't promise or you really can't give any uh, fixed values or be benefits. If you really if you really like AWS, you, you go and sell the AWS. You really like Azure, you go and sell the Azure. But at the end, whatever the cost that you are suggesting, you will see 20 to 30 percent variation in the bill. Okay. Okay, because in, in, in life, it's in, never going to be the same what you thought. And over the over the over the years, it will always you'll always see a lot of changes. Okay. So, okay. Right. Yes. Back to our topic. <clears throat> so, how to access the portal? You need to enroll yourself into. AWS dot Amazon dot com free subscription. Create an account. Okay. It's more of creating your Gmail account only. I'm not going to explain in detail. Okay. Just fill these details. Let me open up another browser. AWS. Yeah, let's create an account here. So you can you can fill these details. Okay, once. <clears throat> You logged in. 
Okay. And you get the same screen. Okay. But whenever you try to click on any component or try to deploy any of these components inside the AWS, okay, it will automatically take you to the billing page because unless until you don't set the billing, you will not be able to use the portal. Okay. So if you go to building dashboard, Okay, so billing preferences, I'll set the billing method, first of all, okay. you need to, yeah. you need to add your card here. Okay, do one thing, if you have a credit card, it's fine, or else put your debit card, and what it will do, it will deduct around two rupees and it will enable the free tier. Free tier doesn't mean everything is free. Please remember, okay? When once your practice is done, delete everything. Please never ever keep anything inside the portal, especially the elastic IPs and, and the VPC components never ever keep because for each and every hour, they will charge you around one dollar if you leave those components as a stale objects okay and i'll show you how to set the limits for each and every component or per day if you even if you forget okay it will automatically give you a pop-up or it will automatically send you an email saying you have reached your threshold so that at least you can save something Okay, these things you need to make sure before you start practicing anything inside the AWS. Now, <clears throat> once your account is set up, okay, once your free tier is created, provide your debit card details or a credit card details, and it will take around five hours to set up your account. Sometimes if, if, you're, if your debit card details and your current address, what you mentioned, if the locations are not matching it will take around one day to activate okay so create uh, is this tushar and madhavi you people can create your free accounts okay and once the account is created now where where do we need to start What is AWS region? Okay, if you if you go to portal on the right hand side top corner, you will see some of these locations mentioned here. What all these locations? Anyone? Locations or the physical locations where the actual uh, uh, the AWS has their hardware installed because virtual is something where something really presents at somewhere and we can use it. So, okay. typically a data center. Yeah. So, let let's take an example. I'm working for a company where they have a data center in. US, as I said yesterday, team or you people are working in remote office in India. Let's say most precisely Pune. <clears throat> now, what you have inside this data center, you'll have your computing networking and storage right this is your data center and you have a private connection between both the sites and you are supporting from remote office now company has taken a decision saying we are migrating onto 
cloud and decided on agreed a partnership with AWS. Now, what is cloud? Basically, what we discussed yesterday. What is cloud? Guys, come on. Okay, I'll simply say it is also a data center. Okay, managed by someone else. Who is this someone else in our scenario? <laughs> okay, now you have chosen AWS as your cloud partner for next three years and you have a data center in US and you pl you're planning to move all these servers from here to here right in short in short previously you're accessing you're accessing your business or your servers your applications like this eventually after a few months your aim is to migrate everything over here and you people access everything from here right so what it has as i said same data center it will have the same same racks same servers same computing right same storage but managed by amazon web services agree on this now i want to understand little detail about this setup because <clears throat> if you are managing all these things on a day-to-day -day -day basis okay you should understand how this has been set up not on the technical standpoint not at least for your day-to-day -day management Okay, in technical standpoint, everything is managed by AWS physically. But what you will do, right? You, you, you don't need to do, or you don't need to worry about physical aspects. But you need to understand how that that has been set up, and which one you want to use it. Okay, for that, let's say you have a US region. So where you will migrate your servers? you want to migrate on to Azure. Hmm? AWS has many regions. Let me go back. What is this region? The physical locations are composed of regions and availability zones. Just like your Azure. If you are familiar with Azure, AWS has also the similar concept. Okay. Whatever the physical locations that they have posted their services, they composed into technically two different components one is region region is just a location you can say okay then what is availability zone okay each aws region is a separated geographic area okay. and each region has a multiple isolated locations known as availability zones okay. let's understand this AWS regions and maybe availability zones. Okay, so your objective is I'm just writing on here. Your your objective is you have one small data center and one support center 
both are integrated this is in us and this is in india now your, your your aim is to migrate or wash out this you need to find out the feasible location okay when it comes to aws regions aws has a global presence right so they have a data center across the globe us us UK so just take an example and so on okay so how many regions they have these are the all available regions where you can deploy your workloads Okay, then what is availability zone? What is availability zone? Let's say this is US, Ohio. They have a region and inside the region they have six build six separate buildings you understand what i'm saying and all are connected with let's say dark fiber or good connectivity so consolidatedly, all these six buildings, you call it as region. In short, region is collection of availability zones. Why you need availability zone? Any, any reason? Anyone? To have high availability redundancy. For which? Um, like if one goes down, it will check for the nearest data center. DFs, disaster recovery planning. Like, okay, let's say for example, I have millions of customers who are using US services in this region and they are deploying their workloads here. Okay. For some reason, if this building goes down, all these resources and the services that what they have posted for their customers, they are already replicated across the zones, and they can simply bring it from here. Some of the services, not all the services, because most of the services you need to add out or you need to you need to deploy based on availability zones. Let's say, for example, you have to deploy high available application. High available application means you require two servers. And what kind of application? Some web server. You deploy two, two servers and deploy one load balancer and request will come to load balancer and you have two servers in the back end so the suggestion is put one server here because it is in corner one in the same city or street one in the same city and this is in another street in the same city and second server you can place it here if this building goes down still your website will keep on working because the second server is still up and running that is what availability means even if one building goes down you don't see any downtime in your customer and all so for that high availability you have a six different buildings 
in the same city so that you can place your workloads in six different location and each each zone has good adequate bandwidth connectivity between other zones within the region in fact all the regions have the private connectivity that is different back end connectivity that is a different story but when it comes to region they have some good con bandwidth connectivity so that they can replicate the huge data between the zones clear on this yes Madhavi, clear? You want me to repeat once again? Images. Just a second. and availability zone that's fine <clears throat> okay four regions some some <clears throat> in some of the locations you have seen only two regions but in Ohio you'll see six regions it's a bigger one because most of the business will run over there and they are maintaining around six Virginia and Ohio as well. Okay, if you want to look at, I'll show you. Availability zone. You have six availability zones. Okay. <clears throat> Means six different buildings in the same region. We'll see. Okay, understand? So let's move on. Else, what I'll say rather than this, prepare what I can say. How you will prepare your network setup in order to set up the customer environment. Means what? Hmm? Anyone? Prepare your network setup for environment means, uh, first of all, we need to decide like uh, on what zone you want to have your infrastructure and how you <clears throat> do a connectivity uh, to that zone uh, and all the proper network setup how would you access your application what kind of network that you need to have uh, any risk of ip for you and all. yeah so if you recollect the example what i've said okay now the plan is to move into 
AWS. Now you want to connect like this. So what kind of setup you need to establish and inside how it looks like. Okay, if I go inside the AWS and external connectivity, if I explain the external connectivity, okay, it's fairly simple. But I need to understand how this has been set up and how this is being in place since last 10 or 15 years. Okay, I need to understand this first and then we can plan this at second stage. Understand my question? You already have an existing customer environment which is running since last 10 years. Now you are planning to migrate everything onto AWS. Okay, before you prepare your customer environment for, you, before you prepare your network environment for your customer, you need to understand how the network setup or network topology that has been in place since last 10 years then we can take some decision and see how it can be done in AWS. You agree on this point? Tushar, you there? Madhavi, yes. You there? Okay. So my simple question is, You understand any of these two questions? When, I, when I'm trying to create something on AWS, I need to understand what we have in the on-premise. So my question is, what kind of IP addressing that you're using and you have any free IP ranges in your environment? Okay. Okay, what is your answer on the answer to this? Because if you're planning to do something on AWS, you need to understand something on on-premise as well. Like we need to understand how the internet is there in the on-premise, like what kind of network they are using, which IP ranges, uh, and also what are the subnets they are taking. So how to build the same environment in cloud with the same network. What that is what my question is. Yeah, what you know about so, the current environment? Okay, be on mute. So basically, you need to understand what what IP address class that they are using. For that, you people are, you people have to understand the basic IP address class. Okay. And again, what is the difference between public and private IPs? Okay, and this subnetting. You have any idea of? about this class a b c d sorry class a 1 2 class. yeah 1 2 1 2 1 26 192 192 192 191 192 these are we will discuss in detail what is these classes and how this can be used in AWS. Okay, so what I can say, 
we need to understand what all the classes that are available in your on-premise and what are the available CIDRs before if I want to go and create something on AWS okay and I need to understand the difference between private and public because you will not send everything over the public internet or public IP address you will have a minimal public IP addresses in your environment and most of the most of the infrastructure you'll host it on private IP addresses all right so how how that can be achieved and what is subnetting and what is uh, VPC you people already know a few things but let me repeat once again about all these things okay so tomorrow what we will do is we'll start with this IP addressing and stuff and then we'll understand how the network topology is and we'll try to put some designs in place for your network topology within AWS and then we'll continue. This is the plan. So next class, purely IP addressing. Okay, any questions from today's session? No, I don't have any. Mm -hmm. And uh, Shin, I, I just uh, uh, recollecting one uh, URL. I'm not sure, like if you could just help me out in getting that. So there is a link where it just gives the exact uh, uh, physical appearance of uh, AWS, like we see on the globe. Uh, so if you could just have that link handy, can you share it to us? Physical. Uh, not sure like how I can say that. So it it, uh, it gives a AWS locations uh, on a global, like how you see a globe uh, with all the networking and all, uh, just to uh, visualize that, uh, you know, uh, how the reasons are, in, uh, but I'm not getting that exact link. In the past, like I think I saved it. Okay. This one? Yeah, that's, yeah, this is the one. So this gives some idea about how physical servers are getting connected uh, to each data centers and what kind of network it is there. So it just gives some glance of the feel uh, how they are yeah. connected. Yeah. And understand? Yeah, I'll just ping you on chat. Okay, you people can save it. I guess it's more of. Uh, how they are connected to yeah how internally physically they are connected and what what are the differences between those zones like if we can point out those uh, cursor on that that it will give us a, a detail of okay how it is connected and how it is connected to the other availability zone yes but yeah but my concentration is more of uh, in a single specific region okay how these things can be adopted and how you want to uh, utilize these ip addresses and stuff and class a b or c irrespective of what customer environment you're working on how you can design these ip addresses and how you can design these vpc and stuff for your customers so more okay. concentrated on network design okay and i will start with the basics tomorrow and then we'll continue with the rest of the stuff it will take around we'll say 10 to 15 sessions not more than not more than that just to understand various network components how you will handle them in your customer environments along with that how you will <coughs> design them for your customer delivery these things, okay. these, things will, these things will try to cover in tomorrow's sessions okay so just let me stop recording here. Yep.